Schoenberger. I'm the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Frenchman's Bay Library. And I'm here representing half of the group, one of the groups of providing this program. Uh, some of you may not know that when Dr. Heath donated this building, and he speci had specifications of what he wanted it used for. He wanted it used for the public, for a library, and for the general enrichment of the community. And he, then the last of those things was that he wanted to expand the community's knowledge of the native people of this area. And so as we have been moving along and trying to meet and honor that wish, we were lucky enough to get a grant that provided us with the monies to buy, purchase a, I don't want to say definitive because everything changes, but the newest materials on the Wabanaki and the people of this area. And we don't want to just concentrate on what is now, what was done to sell to tourists. We want to get a deeper and broader sense of the people who were here thousands of years ago, before the Europeans came. Most of us, when we look at our world, just see the world of today. But if you look at the trees, the grasses, the ocean, the shells, the stones, we've been here, the land has been here for a long time. And we want to honor the people who have lived here before us. And to that point, is it Dr. Gray? No, I dropped out of doctor school. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you can, you can have Toby introduce their piece. Yeah. Oh, yes, and Toby is the head of the Historical Society. And I apologize, I got to get what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> That's fine. Um, hi, I'm Toby Connor. I'm the communications coordinator for the Historical Society here in Sullivan and Sorrento. And I'm so glad that you could join us today. So glad that we can have this presentation. Grateful to Julia. And um, I would just like to say that we acknowledge that we are on Wabanaki lands. This is still their land. They are still here. And it's a part of our history, especially locally in the historical society that has been um, I don't want to say neglected, but it's it's something that we've often overlooked because it's natural for us to focus on our own history, our uh, colonial history, but in reality, we're just a tiny blip <laughs> of the history on this land. Um, white settlers first came here, 17th century. Sullivan became Sullivan in the late 18th century. But um, the Wabanaki peoples have been here on this land for 12,000 years. They have been here on the main coast. We have archeological record of them here at least back 5,000 years ago. And it's a lot of the findings from around Frenchman's Bay that um, got to Dr. Robert Abbey um, inspired to form his collections for the Museum at Abbey Museum, and um, it's it's a, a very rich history, very thousands of years of history. We we folks, <laughs> white folks, European folks, have only been here for a tiny, tiny part of it, and I think it's crucial for us to acknowledge the significance of the area and the significance of the indigenous people that have been here and are still here. 
and so we honor that by spreading awareness and by having Julia here to present on the history, pre-contact history, what was it like in Sullivan. Sullivan Waukeed is um, the name, the native term for the area that was used around Taunton Bay. Um, and we would love to use that name more often. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Julia Gray and also remind folks afterwards. We have our exhibit, a little exhibit over here of uh, artifacts that you're welcome to look at. And of course, plenty of refreshments. And to you. Yeah, thank you. What a wonderful turnout for a, Sunday, a Saturday afternoon, the day before our day, before our hopefully last snow of the season. Um, uh, my name is Julia Gray. I am in my current role, I'm the executive director of the Wilson Museum in Castine, Maine. But I was at the uh, Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor for 17 and a half years in various capacities, running collections, exhibits, education, and so on. Um, and I've been doing archaeology in Maine since 1989 um, in various capacities. Um, I am a settler descendant 100%. Um, I am, I'm of, of largely English descent, and my ancestors on both sides came here um, relatively early in the in the settlement of in the European settlement process and colonization of this area. Um, but I've been working with and learning from and about um, Wabanaki folks for a long time, and so I will do my best to represent. What, what I can from my perspective, acknowledging that this is my perspective as an archaeologist, anthropologist, museum person, you may get a very different um, perspective and, and, and balancing perspective to my perspective if you, when you work on bringing Wabanaki folks in. So um, the, the Wabanaki name for this place, there's various ways it's spelled, and I'm not, and I will make no guarantee that I pronounce it correctly, um, so I'm not a Wabanaki speaker, but um, the, the you, sometimes you'll see it as Wabanaki, which is the short version of that, and then the, the first three letters, I'm not 100% sure how to correctly pronounce that because I've heard it a lot, but Chwapanaki is approximately how I would best get my would best stab at saying that. Referring to this place as being the place of the first light or the place of the dawn. Um, if you're thinking of your world view being Turtle Island or North America, which is the homeland of the Wabanaki, this is the part of that landscape that first sees the sunrise, right? first sees the dawn. There are other um, tribal nations that actually refer to the Wabanaki as kind of the keeper of the eastern door, or you know, the, the, there's, a, there's a relationship that is recognized more broadly in the Wabanaki country. Um, so we're going to be talking about the pre-contact, pre-European contact, um, what we know about pre-contact life here through primarily archaeological evidence. I'll touch on some of the other lines of evidence that you may gain more insight from from hearing from other folks who, who have that expertise, but my expertise is, is through archaeology, so we're going to talk about that. That's not going to work. Is that going to work? There we go. Um, so I, I have to not assume that everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say Wabanaki. And that's, the, that's kind of the contemporary anglicized version of that longer word that we saw on the first, on the first screen. But the Wabanaki, the people of the first light, the Wabanaki is a confederacy. It's not, there's no Wabanaki tribe. It's a confederacy of multiple tribes that call Northern New England and adjacent Canadian, Canadian provinces home and have for thousands of generations. Um, the tribes, the contemporary tribal names that, that make up the Wabanaki Confederacy are the Abenaki, Micmac, Maliseet, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy. And they, again, their, home, their homeland spans Northern New England, depending on exactly how, what, you know, how you look at it, potentially parts of Northern Massachusetts and then into the Canadian Maritimes and parts of Quebec. The Wabanaki have been here for, gener for thousands of generations, and this is their homeland. Their story, their creation story, tells of them being created here. So they didn't, in, in their, their stories of their origin are that this is where they were created. They did not move here, they did not migrate here from Siberia across a land bridge. This is where the Wabanaki people were created. Um, archaeologists tell different stories sometimes, um, but, but as, I, as I spent the decades learning with and from Wabanaki people, I became to understand that those are not, those stories work together. Those are not stories that are contradictory to each other. So that's something to kind of hold and think about um, in, a, in a flexible space of thinking about history. 
Um, today, there are approximately 8,500 Wabanaki people in Maine um, in the, in that have been recorded in the census, with more than 65,000 across eastern Can Can New England and northern New England and eastern Canada. Um, estimates of Wabanaki population at the first arrival of first Europeans, something like 25,000, but that's a really tough number to come up with because of the disruption that occurred at, at colonization and um, how that affected population. But that's kind of one of the numbers we talked about. Maybe there are about 25,000 people. Um, and that number probably reflects primarily coastal Maine. <coughs> it's much harder to kind of reconstruct what the populations were in interior Maine at that contact. Um, one of the really important things to, I think, to wrap your head around and understand about the Wabanaki is that across almost all of the east of the, what was now the US east of the Mississippi, Indigenous tribes were displaced. Now, not in New England. If, if, you know, throughout New England, there, the, there, the indigenous people managed to stay. But they did so in various creative and resistant ways. But the Wabanaki were never displaced from their land. Um, and that's incredibly important because, because your land and your landscape and your places is so much of who you are that they've been able to hold on to. It's been shrunk down a whole lot. We'll look at that in a minute. But they've never had to leave their homeland. And so they are still in this place that, that, that is where they were created. And that's really important. Um, oh, did I miss part of that? Anyway, just we, uh, you all can read that. But one of the other things I think that's, that I will, and I will we'll get to this at the end, is to recognize that also the Wabanaki are not a people of the past, they are a people of today, and span that entire time. So we'll hit on that as we get towards the end of the presentation. I always like to leave you with real live living Wabanaki people instead of just 5,000 year old Wabanaki people. This is one, this is a quote that's in the exhibit, the people of the, um, the core exhibit at the Abbey Museum, understanding that, that in, you know, in Wabanaki worldview and in many worldviews, actually outside of kind of Western European worldviews, time doesn't go in a straight line. Time is a circle. Generations come around. Um, and I, I love the, the kind of visual that Jamie creates with the idea of it moving the like ripples of the canoe through the water. It doesn't just, it doesn't just go in a straight line. Um, and the past and the present are always with you. So for, for many folks, again, the Wabanaki, but also for many folks, the, your ancestors are there with you all the time. The place and stories of the past are there with you. These aren't things that are separated somehow from you. So when we think about doing work on, you know, as archaeologists digging up Wabanaki village sites, uh, campsites, and in the past cemetery sites, recognizing that while we see that as being separate and hyper Wabanaki people, those people, those, those ancestors are still right there with us. Um, so yeah, it was all Wabanaki, right? <laughs> it wasn't like, wasn't like there were some gaps there that the Europeans could fill in. Uh, and one of the important things, we had some, this was, this, again, a lot of these visuals are from the Abbey Museum, I, and I'm bringing that with me, but this is, and it's, it's, it's you can see, you can come up there, see, you can see the labels, but the really important thing, and we had a fun time trying to, how do we create this as a visual, is that you'll see the boundaries aren't hard and fast. There's a lot of blending at the boundaries, um, because there is a lot of overlap between what, the tribes that we see today. So if you were to kind of do your best to kind of transpose the current tribal nation on traditional territory, this is kind of what you come up with, but it's really fuzzy at the edges. Um, and also some folks may have encountered, and it's still, it's still used in some, by some scholars, uh, sometimes the word, the term Abenaki is used as the overarching term. So you may read older sources and so on that refer to Abenaki as being the entirety of the area. Most indigenous people would use Wabanaki now and consider the Abenaki as part of the Wabanaki. So it means pretty much the same thing. The word is almost the same. Um, likewise, what I find interesting, the word Wampanoag, the name, the, the name that Wampanoag give to themselves, is also people of the first slight, slight different, slightly different language. They're part of the Agwampan language family. Um, and again, another visual of thinking about, Wab the, Wab about Wabana the Wabanaki territory, Wabanaki homeland. Um, what is it that you see on this that's defined? Is it, again, this, was, this map was created by a Wabanaki person. What is it that you see on this that defines the landscape? What are the, what are the, the, the names that are on there? What are they naming? Rivers. Rivers. They're naming rivers and water bodies. It's the, 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 and, and then there are territory names on there too. There's no, there's no national boundaries, right? That the, the world is, is, is seen and described by its features like the water. Water especially <coughs> being a really important part of that for a variety of reasons. That's, and it's reflected in oral traditions, it's reflected in place names. Um, that was how you traveled. You traveled by canoe uh, across waterways. And the, the uh, printers that you see on this, these are illustrations that were done by Jana Brooks, who's a Malseat artist, uh, who, who 
who lives in New Brunswick and New Brunswick. All right. So now in my area, my <laughs> representing my my experience and my knowledge about how we what we learned about um, Wabanaki history through archaeology. And so I'm going to start out with kind of an overview of how life and maternal culture change over time more generally, and then we'll look at a couple of examples from the Sullivan Sorrento. I'm going to cheat and have the Woodsboro site in there too, um, just because I can talk more knowledgeably about that than some of the Sullivan Sorrento sites. Um, uh, so and, and I actually just made a change to these two these slides yesterday. Um, as, as I continue to learn and work with Wabanaki people. Before this, I had each of these, we had, the archaeologists have names for these time periods. So they've created time periods, and they've assigned names to them that are not Wabanaki concepts. They're not Wabanaki names for these time periods. Um, they are based on kind of technological change and so on. I think understanding that change is still valid, but I want to remove those labels that to me no longer make sense. Uh, it's not, it's not, it, a Wabanaki person living 9,200 years ago, didn't know they were living in the Paleo-Indian period. They were living their life, right? So anyway, uh, I don't know if it makes a big difference or not, but I to go with that. So archaeological evidence tells of Wabanaki people arriving um, here around 12,000, first, first being here in the landscape about 12,000 years ago. Um, there are lots of parts of the Americas where that is changing, and our understanding is going back thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. Um, so the idea that at you know, 12, 15, 12 to 15,000 years ago, this, this continent was populated by migrants across a land bridge or something like that has been pretty much blown out of the water. So um, we don't know what that means for here because we, as of now, we don't have archeological data that says they were here before 12,000 years ago. And geology, geologic information tells us that there was ice here two miles thick, you know, not that long before that time period. So once that ice moved out, then we're starting to see archaeological evidence of Wabanaki ancestors here. Um, they were moving into a space that was recently been cleared by a glacier. It looked basically Arctic, or Arctic and subarctic in terms of its natural environment. Tundra life, very open. There were a lot of large game animals that moved in herds, like mastodons, um, caribou, things like that. Um, they were traveling, they traveled probably quite a bit because the Food resources were probably traveling a lot and were, and were relatively uh, spread out on the landscape. And the stone tools they were making are absolutely stunning. I do not have any of those. I don't, <laughs> so there, we do have uh, locations in Maine where these tools have been found, not on the coast. And we'll, and we'll talk in a minute about why we're not finding, why we don't find these, these 10,000 year old sites on the coast of Maine. Um, that's about water too. Um, but we do find them at other locations. There's a wonderful site in Nova Scotia, there's a site over Western Maine, there's some other places where we find the evidence of these Wabanaki ancestors. As the climate changed and warmed after the last ice age, uh, the landscape started to work a little work more towards what we see today. Forests grew, the, it became warmer. It actually was warmer than it is now for a period of time until it, until, until it settled into where, well, where we were 20 years ago. Um, Again, this became a forested land where you weren't migrating across large open spaces. Um, there's a, a thought, and it, and it varies from, from person to person, that they, this may have been a point at which dugout canoes were introduced because you need this, this foresting of the land forced travel to the rivers as opposed to being able to travel easily across land. Um, there are other folks that think that dugout, the, the birch bark canoe has possibly been here long enough to have been utilized during this time period. Um, the, the evidence for dugout canoes is, real, is more an evidence of tools. We find these heavy woodworking tools made out of stone that could have been used to make things like dugout canoes. The only dugout canoe, um, I'm not a, I think, I, was a dugout canoe found down in in southern Maine, um, and I think that was that was a, a colonial era one, but I'm not. I said I, I wouldn't go out on a limb on that one. I'm not that familiar with that project. Um, they were fishing rivers, they were also fishing, fishing the ocean, and we have um, from sites in, uh, site in, one of the sites in Sorrento, um, and then Half Point, I'm sure it's never one of the sites in Sorrento, the Waterside site, has a ton of swordfish bone in it. So, and this is probably, that's probably about 5,000 years ago. Just think about hunting swordfish from a dugout canoe. Just think about that for a minute, right? Um, but we, but they were clearly hunting swordfish. There is, like again, at that site in Toronto, there is substantial evidence of swordfish being hunted. 
Um, the resources, and I, this is a term that I haven't figured out the right alternate for, because I thought, well, I like the folks are saying relation. But resources is something you extract. Um, plants and animals are something that you live with and you, and you benefit, from your, each benefit from each other. But they were able to come up with the food and the raw material and the medicines that they needed much more abundantly locally, so they didn't have to move quite as much. So they were probably started to settle down a little bit more than they were during the immediate post-glacial period. And one of the things that the general public knows most about from this time period of increased forestation, warming climate, is um, a, a evolution of very elaborate burial practices that we uh, you'll often hear referred to as the red paint people. Um, there's reasons there's reasons not to use that word, which I will touch on in a minute. But this is this is, was kind of one of the first things that caught the attention of, of archaeologists, pre pre professional archaeologists, and others was the evidence of these of these cemetery sites and burial rituals, where you have very distinctive stone tools that are incredibly intensive to make and are. I think stunningly beautiful, collected together with um, concentrations of red ochre, or the derivative from hematite, sometimes yellow ochre. So in the late 1800s and early 1900s, this was what first got archaeologists interested in this in kind of mid-post to, to eastern Maine, was these, was these cemetery sites, and they dug the heck out of them. Um, and there, we're, now, we're now trying to redress that, the fact that these burials were just all dug up, and been, the burial objects have been sitting in museums for 100 plus years. Um, again, back to the fact that you've probably heard the term red peat people. Um, understanding that where that term came from was an idea that the Indians that were here today, when the archaeologists were working in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, were not sophisticated enough to have created these stone tools. There were some, there were some pretty racist attitudes towards native people at that time, and they were, they were not, they couldn't possibly have created these tools. And so they must be a lost race, and it was the lost red paint people that had created these lab tools and these burials. Disconnecting, you know, this, this burial tradition from their wild knocking descendants. And that has continued in some archaeological realms and, and uh, practices, and continues to be a problem today, that, that disconnection of these aren't the same people. Um, there's, in my, in my belief, in my understanding, there's actually abundant evidence that you include archaeology and language and oral traditions and other other scientific lines of evidence that in fact they are the descendants of the folks that buried their, their dead in these, in these elaborate cemeteries. And man, every historical society in from the St. George River, the Kennebec River, east to the Union River has these artifacts in their collections, right? I mean, we, the Wilson Museum has them, the Abbey Museum had them. Um, people have them, I live in Orland where there are five cemetery sites and people have them on their mantelpieces. I'm hoping that we can continue to build awareness that it's probably not a good thing to have somebody's burial objects in your collection and on your nail pieces. So beginning the work of returning those is, if they, or continuing the work of returning those is an important process that I'm happy to talk more about. This is just some examples of some of what we see for material culture, for tools during that, that period of time where we have the, the second, period, kind of second evolution of the environment and material culture we have. Um, this, is, this is swordfish bones, so this is actually the what, what the rostrum or the, the nose of the swordfish bill. Bill. Not the, not the like super pointy part, but just going up to the pointy part, going to mount where, the, where the, that's mounted. So it's super distinctive and very easy to pick up when you see that. Um, large spear points, um, plummets, which are probably fishing weights, whether they were for nets or lines. They may have had some other functions as well. This is uh, an example of one of the kinds of pieces you find in the burials where you have incredibly open beautifully made, incredibly intensive time. You know, you bury people with the best, right? This is, you know, we're honoring our ancestors. The ancestors were burying them with the best of the best, and these are the pieces that you see. <coughs> Which makes it hard for museums to be willing to give them back, right? Because they're beautiful. They're not ours. So the reason, in addition to not seeing a whole lot of you know, any site, really any sites from that first 10,000 or 12,000 to 8,000 year time period, we don't see a whole lot of sites from that second period of time where, we, where the forestation is increased so much because the sea level in response to the retreat of the glaciers was still adjusting at that point. So what you have on this graph is you have um, up at the top is when you have the glacier sitting on the land, two miles of ice pushes the land down. When the glacier retreats, uh, the sea comes in behind it 
Um, and so the oceans quickly, you know, before the land started to bounce back, the oceans went way up. We have, there's marine clay up as far as Mattawamkeag and Lincoln on the Penobscot River Valley. So when people who were first arrived, or when archaeological evidence first showed up of people in what's now Wapanaki territory, we were underwater here, substantially underwater here. So they weren't living around here because we were the ocean. Um, then the land said, oh wait, those two miles away from we're gonna bounce up again. So the bounce, the land, the land rebounded, and then you had it, so you had this like thing where it goes, bounces back up, sea level goes way out because the land has bounced up. And this is where you start to have that 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 time period of the of the large woodworking tools, etc. And so in that case, people living along the coast were living two miles out. Which, now, which is now underwater. So we don't find a whole lot of those locations, we do, but we do. There are the waterside site in Sorrento, the Taft Point site in Gouldsboro, uh, have, have, have evidence of people living on those locations during that like four to 5,000 year time period. Um, following that, there's a pretty um, steep jump up to here and then it gradually changed a little bit and then it was about 2,000 years ago um, that sea level roughly became where it is today, although we know that's a change in target, right? Um, and we'll also, and also as we move into this next time period, so that's why we don't find a whole lot of those really old sites around here. So around 3,000 years ago, two to 3,000 years ago is when this place started to look pretty much like it does today or what it looked like when Europeans arrived, right? Um, you had the mix of vegetation we had, we had the animals we have, the, there were uh, changes in the currents in the Gulf of Maine that brought cold water in. So during that, that period of time where you see by this swordfish model, those swordfish were actually relatively close to land because the Gulf of Maine was much warmer than it is today. And then with the bouncing back of things, we got the big tide shifts that we have now, and that brings cold water in. And it's that cold water that creates the spruce fir coastal forest that we have today. So that, that distinctive kind of you know, scudic point, you know, I think of it as like, you know, especially as you go further down, you get that, that kind of scrubby, scrubby spruce shore that almost looks a little bit subarctic. That's because of the cold, foggy air that we now have off the level of Maine, so water kind of lose it. But, um, during this, this last time period, technological adjustment before the arrival of Europeans, we see the appearance of clay pottery. Um, there was certainly clay pottery being done before this in other parts of the country. We don't know exactly how, if it was a transfer of information, whether they kind of innovated it locally, but we do know they were making clay pots from local clay. Um, we think that the bow and arrow, based on stone tools we're finding, that the bow and arrow was adopted as a hunting tool at this point. Um, and that birch bark canoes, the, the, the strongest evidence for birch bark canoes appearing, on, appearing in the material culture is about this time period. Um, we start to see settlements further up the rivers, which is also evidence that birch bark canoes, it's a lot easier to portage a birch bark canoe than a dugout canoe. Um, and we see people moving up in, in inland perhaps more. Um, and we see a, a, a definitely an increased growth of host of inshore maritime resources uh, and, de and an increase in regional trade. We find the biggest evidence we find in regional trade is stone material for making stone tools. It's coming from Labrador, Pennsylvania, um, Quebec, uh, as well as local materials. So there's definitely you know, really elaborate trade networks being developed. Um, and south and west of the Kennebec, there's evidence of adoption of corn beans and squash horticulture. So they started, their people started growing crops. Um, historically, that extended into this neck of the woods, but prior to European contact, we don't have any direct evidence of cultivation of crops. In the they did have dogs. They had domesticated dogs in, you know, the entire time. And then the Europeans start to arrive. The 1550 date is probably a little late in reality because there's a very good likelihood that there were especially Basque fishermen that were coming to the Gulf of Maine, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, George's Bank, well before that time. Um, my like, you know, imagination kicks and says, well, they were finding, they were coming and they were finding abundant resources of cod. They didn't really want to tell anybody that where they got that cod, so they weren't, they weren't real good records of the fact that they'd been here. That's just my like historical imagination kicking in. Um, but that the 1550 is kind of when there's more solid evidence, and then we have 16. 04 is St. Croix's in the first year round, not very long, just one year round, and it wasn't very successful. Um, and then by the, by the 1620s, 1630s, then we have year round settlements of Europeans happening in the eastern Maine. Um, 
this was a huge change, right? I mean, these were people that had been living on the landscape for this point, 12,000 years at least. Um, they had adapted to that. They were trading with each other. They had networks with other people, speaking other languages. But those were not destructive relationships. This was a very destructive relationship for a long period of time, and it continues to be in many ways. Um, you know, trade was important, and trade introduced some amazing new things that, that fed artistic traditions that I'm sure most of my people are, are you know, still love to practice, working with, with uh, silk and wool and glass beads, um, working with metals, these sorts of things. But on the balance, it was, it was a lot more loss than there was gain. Um, one of the biggest impacts was, was disease, introduction of disease. Uh, interestingly, the numbers from a lot of Maine are not quite as intense as they were from places where they were living in settled villages. Certainly for like Penobscot and Passamaquoddy and Micmac and Mountain ancestors to the east, these were still a relatively dispersed population and that helps with disease spread, like we learned that, right? We learned that being dispersed helps us not spread disease. Um, so some of those eastern, you know, some of the more, that, that, ones that were still hunting and gathering, not living in villages with, with agriculture, fared a little bit better. Um, there's also a pretty big distinction between how Wabanaki, who interacted primarily with the French at first versus primarily with the English at first fared. Uh, the French had a very different approach to settlement. They were mostly focused on trade and Catholicism, so they wanted to trade with folks, and, they, and it's much easier to have Wabanaki people harvest the beavers and so on, and she didn't have to send their own people over to do it. They married into Wabanaki families. Um, that's a big part of the Cassidy narrative, right? The, the Madaka Wando's daughter, Mala Matilde, married the Baron of St. Castan, and many folks at Penobscot Nation are descendants of that today. Um, and the French wanted to convert people to Catholicism. The English basically <coughs> just wanted land, um, and so they just killed people. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not, that seems kind of harsh, but that's pretty much what happened. Um, so, all of that may also be why you see that the tribes that have territory in Maine today are largely east of the Kennebec and are in that French realm of influence as opposed to the English. That's certainly a big factor. So, again, some examples from that. We have pottery, we have uh, um, elaborate bone tools. They probably were making elaborate, no, they were making elaborate bone tools during the previous time periods. One of the types of archaeological sites we see during this last 3,000 years is the shell, mitten, the shell heaps. And shell neutralizes veins acidic soil and preserves bone. So we have a lot more information about bone tools, animals that they're eating, and so on during, this, during the last 3,000 years. Some examples of the stone tools that they're making. All right, so that was the big picture. Now we're going to zoom it in to the Sullivan, Sorrento, et cetera area, recognizing that. Those are current boundaries and not Wabanaki boundaries. Um, and again, here I am, I am looking at our, what archaeologists explored and have postulated and thought about as opposed to Wabanaki stories of this place. That would be somebody else. I'm, I'm not, since I'm not Wabanaki, I can't do that part of it. So uh, there, was, uh, there was a Harvard archaeologist, Charles Willoughby, who worked in Maine in the late 1800s. Um, I don't, I, 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 I I'm not aware that he worked in this neck of the woods, but we certainly do know that Warren Moorhead, who's an archaeologist from out of the RSP Museum in Andover, Massachusetts, did work in this area. And this is a map from his book, The Archaeology of Maine, that shows the sites that he was aware of in, in this neck of the woods. So you have, and again, I know it's probably tough to see from a distance, you know, but you have, you can kind of see these little X's here. All these little X's are shell heap sites that Morehead identified either by visiting himself or talking to local folks and finding out where those are. Uh, and then there's one. Yeah, it's tough to see on here, but there, there, yeah, he, there, there is one um, maritime, there's one cemetery site on the, salt, on the Hancock side of Sullivan Falls that dates to that kind of three to five thousand year time period. Um, all of, well, everything else that's identified in here are these little X's, which is shell heap sites or campsites. Um, and most of these we still, you know, these are places that we still know about. If, you, if you're involved or you look at current maps, and these, are, these are places that we still know about. Some are still somewhat intact, some not so much. The, at Sullivan Falls, that cemetery site, um, even when Moorhead arrived in 1913, he found that most of the site had been demolished by a railroad spur off the Hancock Point Railroad that had been built. 
and, and he was going around to the railroad workers' houses trying to find the artifacts that they had brought home with them um, as, as the railroad was, was disturbing the burials. And again, I think probably there are folks that have inherited those in households around the area that still have those pieces that their that their ancestors a couple of generations back found in their family that they always were into the cellular falls. Um, this reiterates what kind of was had kind of just kind of touched on before I started that this area, um, and it's certainly the whole coast of Maine was a wonderful place to live during this 3,000 to 500 year time period. Frenchman Bay, Blue Bay, Flanders Bay was a, apparently a very attractive place for Wabanak folks during that last 3,000 years because it is, there, is, uh, there is abundant evidence of their time spent here. There are multiple village sites. There's multiple, they were here year-round. There was an evidence of shift, you know, shift across the landscape during different seasons, but there's evidence of substantial year-round um, living in this space that you all now call home by Wabanak people for thousands of years. It's a good place to live. Um, there's lots of plant flats. There's, there's uh, interesting ocean currents that do interesting things. It's a good connection point. You know, there's some there's some canoe routes and portage routes that get you in a lot of different places. So really, uh, definitely a, a busy place for those thousands of years. Again, you know, one of the one of the locations that that was clearly significant for thousands of years again was was Sullivan Falls. We see this across the landscape. Place falls where you can do things like catch fish during fish runs and various things are definitely popular spots to have villages. Um, most of these cemetery sites were around fish run locations. Um, not exactly, you know, perhaps because you could gather a lot of people together during you know, a white, white run, you'd have a lot of food, you could gather together and bury people. Um, but that's not unusual to have these, these um, three to, you know, well, four to, four to 6,000 year old cemeteries on, on falls. Old, the old bridge, that's the old bridge, that's the old bridge. <laughs> um, skip up uh, two decades, uh, and this is the map, you've got the book over in the exhibit case. This is the map from uh, uh, Wendell Hadlock's book, Three Shell Heaps. Uh, Wendell Hadlock was at the Abbey Museum, was this is when the Abbey Museum started doing archaeological research in the area. Um, and again, just reiterating, even just, you know, the, the, Flanders, the Flanders Bay, Jones Cove section of Frenchman Bay, and the wealth of Wabanaki village sites that were here. And these are all, the little, these little marks are all shell heap sites. Large and substantial shell heap sites. All sites a little bit smaller, but the rest of these are, these are major village sites that were occupied over hundreds or thousands of years by Wabanaki folks, and that have been excavated over a hundred years or so. Um, in this case, they're, they're, the Abbey Museum, they go, there are more. I mean, there's, if we know there are ones on, Cat Island and probably all kinds of other sites, but this just shows the ones that the Abbey was looking at at the time. Now I'm going to zoom in on two sites that I know the most about because I worked on um, the Ewing Bragdon site in Sorrento and then the Tranquility Farm site in Goldsboro. Uh, one of the things that I th that hopefully I will will happen over time, and I haven't I, I haven't entirely made that shift yet. We're, we're still calling these wild, important Wabanaki places by the by the name of their owners in the early 1900s, right? Because that's who was there when the archaeologists showed up, so they got named after who owned the land now, as opposed to Wabanaki names. Um, so that's something that we can, that's a good thing to work on is how do we how do we better name these places, uh, not naming them by them now. But at the time when the Abbey Museum started looking at this location, it was owned by the Ewing and the Bragdon family. So it crossed both. Um, and I will say that if you don't already know where these are, I'm not going to tell you um, because we don't want people going to these places. One, because it, it tends to lead to destruction, and also because they're all on private property. So, um, but probably half the people don't know anyway. That's how it works. <laughs> so this is a photograph from excavations in the 1940s at the Ewing Bradford site. The Abbey did work there. The University of Pennsylvania did work there, and then the Abbey returned in the 2000s. Um, it was one of the sites covered in, again in Hadlock's Three Shell Peaks of, of Frenchman Bay, which is an interesting you know, snapshot of how archaeologists were interpreting the evidence they were finding in the 1930s and 1940s. But this continues to be what, if you were to continue, to, if you were excavating a shell heap site today, this is, this is a good example of the range of types of things that you would be finding. You'd be finding 
stone tools in various forms, arrowheads, spear points, knives, scraping tools. Again, a wonderful array of you know, sites that aren't, that don't have shell, or anything made out of bone or made of material that's dissolved. The main soil is really acidic. So all you're seeing is the stone. When you think about, we'll look at a picture towards the end that gives you sense of like, how much of the material culture we're not seeing as archaeologists. That's also important to think about. What do I know? I know it as an archaeologist, not a Wamaki person. Um, I know what is preserved, not what isn't preserved. But I had worked for the first 15 years of my archaeology, or 10, yeah, 10 years of archaeology, I'd worked mostly on interior sites and found stone and little tiny bits of. Then I go work on shell heap sites, and oh my god, the bone tools are amazing. Um, those are some examples. These excavations in the, in, the 30, in the 30s and 40s, they only really kept the really amazing stuff, they didn't keep a lot of the information that we tend to collect nowadays. Um, this is when we returned in the 2000s for several years to the Union Graduate site to do additional research to try and figure out what, was, what evidence was left behind from those earlier excavations. The area had been gardened, so what you're seeing here is this top kind of, this layer here is what we call the plow zone, because it had been plowed and gardened, so that kind of mixed up, you know, homogenized everything in that top layer. But when this place had been a Kwabnaki campsite, they had dug into the ground and put, you know, put fire pits in, put food storage pits in, so there were these lovely um, collections of information that had not been plowed up and not been disturbed, where we would find a lot, primarily evidence of things like what they were eating, um, animal bones, plant remains, and so on. The charcoal also helps preserve and burn, burn plant remains because they're better than unburned ones. Uh, so we find these little bits of information. Um, and a good example of why folks going in and just digging sites with clam rakes, is you lose so much, like if we know everything that came from this place and we're able to radiocarbon data, we have a ton of information that we wouldn't have if we just raked it up and brought the cool arrowhead and both went to the town, right? You lose all that other information. In features like this at the Ewing Dragon site, um, you find the bone of the animals that they were eating or using for other raw material. Um, a range of fish, a range of birds, mammals. One of the really interesting things that, that we, we had to ask some questions of local folks actually to figure out why were we finding so much tom cod at the Blue Dragon site? Tom cod is an estuarine estuary species largely. It doesn't, it's not like, a, and the current location is just a gravel beach um, with open water off of it. Not, there's, it's not a tom cod habitat now at that location. In talking to some old timers, not all the old timers, we found out that there had been eelgrass beds, so significant eelgrass beds along that shore until, in the scheme of things, relatively recently. That then allowed us to make sense of why we were finding so much tom cod at the site, because it wasn't, it wasn't right now, nowadays, it wasn't a tom cod habitat. And tom cod, frost fish, you know, very familiar, but it was clearly a very important um, fish. It's also easy to identify archaeologically, it's most distinctive, it's as distinctive um, for the birth, so that's helpful. Um, the, the adult, the, the full-size cod, the co regular cod cod that we find at these sites are huge compared to what's harvested today. You find these vertebrae that are, you know, huge compared to any cod fish that's harvested today and giving you a, giving you a, a glimpse of the impact on fisheries, you know, even really early on, you know, with the arrival of the Europeans. Um, if it lived here, they harvested it and they used it and they ate it and they used the materials pretty much. Uh, this is an example, a snapshot of some of the artifacts that we were finding in the, in the, this was the 2008 excavation, so again you're seeing stone tools, you're seeing bone tools, we were, we were finding pieces, you know, a lot of the site we were digging where they had already dug and we were recovering what they didn't bother to keep in those early excavations. Um, an impressive question, this is just a few of them, we found a number of these shell, disc shell beads, um, which were probably on a burial at one point, but have now been plowed through and distributed throughout the site. Um, the animal bone was kind of things weren't, weren't, weren't recovered earlier on. So again, kind of just a glimpse. And that again, you'll see it reflects what you see when you look in the things over there. Um, this little guy right here is a this piece here and this piece here are little uh, you call them thumbnail scrapers, or a little bit bigger than my thumbnail, but they're little scraping tools for. Working things like bone and wood, potentially skin, although these are a little small for skin working, probably for making these um, bone points, they were an important tool. Those are both made out of material that comes from Nova Scotia. It's very distinct in the from Nova Scotia, and that means those trade networks in place.
hopping across. You can almost kind of think, I don't think you can actually see Tranquility Pond from your bag because it's an island in a way, but we're literally just on the other side now, Los Angeles Bay, we're hopping across to Hillsboro. Um, Tranquility Storm site is probably one of the largest shell heap sites on Frenchman slash Flanders Bay. Uh, it covers a very large area. It covered a larger area prior to <coughs> sea level rise. Also, um, the ex they, they, it was first excavated in the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s by Abbey Museum, Moorhead to a certain extent. Um, and that excavated area was more huge and it destabilized the site. So there was a huge erosion that happened. We have pictures of a fish camp that was there that the family had that energy washed away because that excavation, when you when the when the sites the bottom of the shells are like super weaved together, they're really tight. When you dig them up and you make just looser piles, it becomes really subject to erosion. So that those early excavations probably contributed to substantial erosion at the site. We had come to work on areas that hadn't been previously excavated, which is actually interesting because what we what we see at this site, we see some other pictures. It was big enough and undisturbed enough that we were able to see that what you have in the, kind of in the middle is the hidden. So you have the where they were where you find the, the shells being dumped, the animal bones being dumped. But as you get to the edges of these shell heaps, you start to find evidence of where their houses were. You find post holes, you find clear, you know, outlines of uh, wigwams, fire pits, um, and you start to see that evidence in addition to just kind of the mass accumulation of artifacts and material you find in the middle of the earlier archaeologists were. And this is just, I mean, you know. We're, we're, when we were doing field schools, we were bringing folks from all over the place to spend a week on the coast of Maine doing archaeology. And these are absolutely beautiful places. I mean, this is, you know, the, the Tranquility Farm site is an absolutely beautiful location. It's not surprising that people hung out there for thousands of years. Um, and again, we're seeing, you know, it's, it's reinforcing what, we, what, we're, what we've been seeing for a while. We're finding um, distinctive bones. You know, this is an example of a moose kind of ankle bone. Um, a bear uh, paw bone, which by the way, bear is often mistaken for human by folks that aren't experts at it, which is an interesting thing. Um, these bones are really cool. Uh, this is a seal ear bone. So seals have this really dense bone um, inside of their ear that's part of their ability to hear underwater. It preserves would be really well. And even, a, I'm not a, I'm not a, they call a faunal archeologist. My expertise is not identifying animal bones, but even I can identify one of these seal ear bones. And seals are definitely an important food source and raw material source. Uh, teeth make good pictures because teeth are more like if I showed you a bunch of just like fragments of bog bones of different animals, you'd be like, oh, okay, those look like little square bits of bone. But teeth look cool, right? Um, you've got uh, large, I think this is probably seal. Uh, this is a uh, smaller carnivore. You've got uh, beaver teeth. Beaver teeth, we're really trying a lot of those because. Well, can be identified a lot because they're, they're, they're also, they also make good work with woodworking tools because they evolved to be woodworking tools. So be really good for the same thing. This is the uh, cheek tooth, the back tooth from a beaver or possibly a raccoon. But teeth make good pictures. <coughs> and again, the visual representation of all of the, uh, of not all of them, the, the animals that we found evidence of people at Tranquility Farm site had <coughs> used or had. We've got a domesticated dog here. This is a picture. Looks pretty much like what we think the dogs look like um, prior to your time. I will see you back here. Wonderful range of main critters. Um, there is every chance that they were all, I mean, we know they're eating shellfish, and there was substantial use of, of soft shell clam. Um, we find evidence of sea urchin, it's not, that's hard, really hard to preserve in pencils, so you find it tends to just disintegrate. Um, we do find evidence of mussels. Um, we don't find evidence of lobster and crabs, but that's because the material the lobster and crabs are made of doesn't really preserve. So there's certainly, they, we certainly expect that they were using those shellfish as well, we just don't find them large So that's why you're not seeing those on that. Um, and tons of clam, <laughs> lots and lots of clam. Uh, more examples of the type of pottery that you see. Uh, may not be what one expects when one thinks pottery, but if you've done any work on these sites, that's what it tends to look like. It's made from local marine clay. Low temperature fired in a in a in a coal pit, basically. Um, these are relatively plain, but oftentimes they're decorated with impressions on the surface. They're not painted or anything like that. They just use impressions to, to decorate them. And then through doing the excavations the way they were done at Tranquility Farm, we were finding things together that helps us understand the time period that people were at the site. So one of the nice things about pottery is it's, it's because it's so malleable and you can 
and the decoration is so adjustable, we see that the, that the decor decoration patterns changed on pottery more frequently than they did a lot of other things. So we can narrow down time period based on how the pottery is decorated. In this instance, this little arrow, arrow or spear point base, which is you know, tells us time period pretty well. And the pottery, we also do come together. So we know the people that created these were living at this location. Um, and BP is before present, so that's 1,500 years ago. And then likewise, in another part of the site, this, this corner notch point and this piece of pottery, which is decorated a little bit differently, that tells us we were there between 600 and 1,000 years ago. And it's pretty exciting as an archaeologist to find a point. You, don't find, you find a lot of broken stuff. You don't find, you don't find ones that are not nice. Um, thinking about you, you know, functional but also beautiful, these, when you, it, 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 this is quartz. Um, it really popped when it was fat. It's pretty amazing to see. It's really hard. I, I am not a flint knife, but it's really hard to make something out of quartz. It does not behave well. So that's a pretty unique piece that they were able to get a piece of quartz and put the effort into making that. So that's pretty cool. And it broke eventually. But. Um, again, another, you know, a, a bone harpoon for probably, that's probably on the size to be lifting seal or porpoise. We do find, we do find some evidence, we have more evidence of seal than porpoise, but we still do find evidence of porpoise. Um, I, this is, this is not an exciting looking artifact. This is just a piece of stone left over from making stone tools. But what's interesting about this, it's a good example of the type of stone that they were using around here. That we think is that we think is locally sourced. We think that there are probably outcrops. It's a fine grained black volcanic material. It's not the Kenya material. It's not it's most of what we find like further down the coast. But we find a lot of this fine grained black volcanic around the eastern part of Trenton Bay. So the expectation is that there are outcrops of this somewhere that people were finding and using. They may there may be more progress on finding where that outcrop is since I stopped doing this work, but. That's, that's the local, if you're going to make stone tools, that's the most locally available material. We, we're guessing to be able to do that with. So if you know where it is, that's cool. Um, also important to recognize that this was not a life of just toil and work. There were things of beauty created. Uh, this is a, a perforated bear tooth that would have been used as a necklace or on clothing. And we find other sources of types of beads and so on. So beauty was being, if you were decorating your clothes, you were doing that. And we're also creating music. Um, we don't find a ton of these, but we do find them. So this is a swan bone wing bone. This was made into a uh, wind instrument. We call it a flute. I don't know if it was played exactly the same um, as a modern flute, but this one is from Tranquility Farm. We find them from other sites, other shell heap sites all along the coast of Maine. Some of them are pretty short. This is probably one of the longest ones that I've seen. Uh, but there was time to create music and create decorations and so on. And most people recognize that, but it's one of those things I want, I want to just make, make sure I pull attention to. Um, another piece of information that we have when we're excavating these is when we find something like a fire hearth, we can collect burned plant material and do a radiocarbon date. So we sat and so we had the pottery pieces and the arrowheads that told us 600 to 1500 years ago there were people on the site. Then we were able to radiocarbon date charcoal from the fire hearth and we got a date of 1,240 years, so within that same time range, you're looking at people living on the Tranquility Farm site for at least, at least between about 600 and almost 2,000 years ago. Uh, the archaeologists working on these sites in the 30s and 40s were not, not gathering that kind of information. And then, as I mentioned before, as we get to the edges of the sites, we're finding evidence of houses and structures. So what you're seeing here is, is that uh, all of those little, these little things were different colored soil that was filled in called post holes. So this is where they had put posts in of some sort to, to support a wigwam or something, or a fish drying rack or something like that. And we're finding the evidence of that. Uh, the, the orange and the white that you see are the, are the based on the mineralization of the soil. So those little depressions was where some kind of post was anchored as part of within the village site. And it's pretty careful slow work to uncover these, these, these pieces of evidence. Um, another really neat thing from shell heap sites like Tranquility Farm, we find shell and we find fire hearths, is that with the right expertise, you can identify the plants that were being used. A lot of the data that we have over the 
centuries of this archaeology work are really all about animals, because it's really, like, the animals are more obvious. You have the teeth, you have the bones. It takes a different level of attention and a different skill set to identify plants. You know, absolutely using all of the plants, right? Um, and this, this shows you some of those um, plant remains, the seeds, the wood fragments that tell us what they're using. It also can help you reconstruct environment. Like, for example, we know during this period of time there were these plants that existed on the landscape because we had them preserved in archaeological sites. Um, there is a possible, one of the, the one plant that we think may have been semi-domesticated or managed in this neck of the woods was the, was the Kinopodium. So there's evidence that this was, um, if not fully domesticated, at least managed as a, um, it's related, it's actually, I think it's related to, um, what's the, I'm almost forgetting, I'm just all the time, the, the South American grain that pops, you know, also, quinoa. quinoa, it's related to quinoa. Um, so it would have been, could have been kind of like a start, you know, a, a grain, almost like a grain like So that's again another example of information that you know, we, we can start to we can reconstruct, at least in part, what life was like and what they were doing. Um, and Tranquility Farm has evidence of interaction with Europeans. Uh, so there were certainly people still living at Tranquility Farm. And there's also evidence of another part of the peninsula of an actual, of probably perhaps an actual French settlement on, the, on that peninsula. We have here, we have a copper all tip. So this would, would have been, a, this piece here is copper that would have been used to tip up on the thing on a bone or wooden handle, because it's all. And then these three are all glass beads, glass tray beads. Quite early, you know, based on the on the on the beads themselves, probably from that very earliest French contact, and probably from not from any of the big guys that we know about, but probably from a French family coming into the area. There's, there's certainly evidence if you dig deep enough of a number of French families living along the coast of this area that are not Champlain and not Saint Silver, but just French families that settled, settled here. You know, so I know their names or a lot of their information, but that's perhaps what these were This one is actually a Venetian French dress with a you know a bead that was made in Venice and it ended up in a lot of the site that was for us. So that's archaeologists. I want to make sure I want to just kind of touch briefly on, so what else, what are the other, like archaeology is just one way that we understand Wabanaki history prior to Europeans. The stories that are told by Wabanaki people is another key source of information. This, this is Gina Brooks' depiction of Buscop, who's a, Wab, the Wabanaki culture hero. He was not entirely a god, not entirely a human. Um, made lots of mistakes, he's a bit of a troublemaker, but taught humans a lot about what they needed to know to live well and right on the land. And the, one of the creation stories that is shared by Wabanaki folks is that Buscop shot an arrow into an ash tree, and when the ash tree split, the first Wabanaki man and woman came out of the heart of the ash tree. If you think about what that, the significance of that is the fact that ash baskets are such an important part of Wabanaki culture today, that they are actually, they, they are made of ash and the baskets are made of ash. That's, that's kind of, but that, again, that tells of them being made here in a place, in this place, of a tree that still grows here. Um, one of the really fascinating things when you, when you try to get scientists to think outside the science box is this um, story that across all, all Wabanaki cultures have this story of when Buscop first arrived, the animals were really big, and they weren't really cooperative for humans, so Buscop made the animals small. Well, when humans, you know, in these, in these 12,000 year time period, you had mastodons, you had giant sloths, you had, you had megafauna. So they were, in fact, really big animals, but then became smaller. So this oral, this story that's been passed on orally over 12,000 years recounts that same thing that, that paleontologists and archaeologists are seeing in their scientific records. So I think that's really cool. There's also stories about um, waterways changing direction, which would have happened as the glacier retreated. That's, those stories exist also. There's, those, that evidence is passed down. Um, this is really hard to see, but we've already talked about it. Place names is another really important piece of information about the Wabanaki presence on this place for generations. Um, interestingly, there's not, a, like, looking at it, this is just the USGS map, there's not as many Wabanaki place names right in this neck of the woods as there are in some other places, which I'm not sure why, um, or that are still, the names still exist, we just don't know them, right? Um, but we have Waki, we have Skudik, um, so, and there is, there is cultural information tied up and embodied in these place names. Um, oftentimes, a place, a Wabanaki place name will describe something you can get there or find there, the place of this or the place of that. 
Oftentimes they will, other times there will be navigational information in the place name, but this is the place where the rapids are, or this is the portage place, so there's navigation information. Um, what it never is is the name of some really important dude that did a war. Like those, those oftentimes don't have place names based on that. Um, and then the language itself, um, being able to, the fact that the Wabanaki, that it's not a lot of speakers, but the fact that the Wabanaki are still speaking their language, all of the information that comes with knowing that language is part of understanding those thousands of years, right? Because that, that language has been spoke, speak, spoken and evolved over those thousands of years and is connected to this place. There's all kinds of information in the language, um, and it's being taught and spoken in all of the Wabanaki communities today in various ways. This is some past, uh, example of Penobscot, and then you have Passamaquoddy, the, the um, Passamaquoddy Malice Language Portal is available to anybody online, it's pmportal.org. The tribe also developed a language app that you only know for tribal members, uh, and there's a, there are some language classes that are open to non-Wabanaki people and others that are only open to Wabanaki people. Uh, the idea, you know, Enough was taken that they're going to they're going to kind of hold on to their language for now. But it, there are other instances where, where it's taught beyond that. Another source of information is certainly early European documentation of Wabanaki culture and life. Um, this is a wonderfully detailed painting from uh, Nova Scotia. So these are this is uh, Mick Mac, uh, one of the friends of the Wabanaki Coast. Did their their canoes are significantly different from? Fallacy, passing body, and non-stack canoes. So you see the funky, that is not a European imagination. That is what the kind of canoes look like. Uh, perhaps because they were more ocean going to a certain extent. But this just has a wonderful detail. It has the animals or something. It has incredible detail in their clothing. You can see all of the, you know, domestic, domestic items in their, in their wigwam. You see a snowshoe, tools. Wonderful, wonderful depiction of kind of the traditional material culture. Um, and then, um, well, early 1900s, you see again, there's, there's, there was still a knowledge and still a presence of this material. I mean, you think about what we were, the little shots of what you find archaeologically, you find like the little pieces of bone, little pieces of stone, pieces of broken ceramics. All of this was there too, which is not preserved. So, what are the sources of information we can tap into to understand the full complexity and diversity of how well our people lived, lived in this place and what they did and used? So we're almost done. Thank you for your patience, Ooh, don't you, Ed? Um, so I'd like to wrap up by bringing us to today and making sure that you leave with real live Wabanaki people in front of your eyes and think about what that means and, and that this is still their place. I was just actually, before my started, just texting with Gabriel Frey, who's a passive pass body basket maker artist. Um, he makes absolutely stunning. Like, I bought a pack basket from him when I could still afford it. Now he makes these, these pack basket purses that are absolutely gorgeous. And, as a museum director, they're not part of my material culture at this point. Um, but he is carrying on generations of tradition to basket making. They went from his grandfather, his grandfather went from his, his grandfather. Uh, and we were texting about harvesting ash trees where we live in Orleans. So. Um, Wabanaki oral traditions continue to be passed down, to be shared. This is a, I wish I'd been able to make this. was a performance that was done down in southern Maine earlier this year um, at Portland Novations with Wabanaki stories and storytelling and music. Uh, so this was literally, literally this, this, this winter um, with a school from each of the tribal communities sharing their stories and engaging folks. Uh, they had a one, one entire performance. It was a marijuana tournament thing on Sunday and they, filled, they brought school kids in for the entire performance. So the whole bunch of school kids, and each of those school kids also got um, what, children's books by Wabanaki authors to take home with them. Um, so you got, yeah. So, uh, Firefly is a Penobscot um, musician who does like this incredible blending of Wabanaki and Penobscot music with like, techno music. I'm not a good like modern like pop music person, but I think that's what you call it. Uh, Jennifer Picture, who's a Micmac artist and storyteller. Uh, um, Wayne Toma, who's one of the most um, Significant, like he's a passing quality speaker who's doing incredible work around passing quality language, and he's also been really active in the sovereignty work, the sovereignty battles that are that the, that the tribes are fighting. Uh, I actually really don't like this is someone I'm not working with, so I'm, I'm not going to remember her name off the top of my head, but uh, another well known performer, and then uh, Chris Newell, who's passing quality, who's an incredible storyteller and scholar, and he was, uh, served as director of the museum for a few years. 
These are, these are Fabaraki people today. This is uh, Emma Slavtoma. She's actually, I think, like double this age now because this was in 2016. She is Molly Neptune Parker's granddaughter or great granddaughter? Well, I think granddaughter. A, a family of, of amazing prolific basket makers. Um, and she is continuing to make baskets. And this is her winning, having won the Youth Basket Award at the Santa Fe Indian Market in 2016. Generations, and she's wearing um, fabric created by a, by another uh, indigenous designer. Um, we still see uh, traditions, <laughs> ceremonial traditions, community traditions continued in the communities. Um, and this is, I like this one because you're seeing there was a period of time where a lot of modern African performers would wear plain style clothing, like the big plains Indian headdresses and so on, because that's what people knew was Indian. Um, what these men are wearing are actually traditional Wabanaki style regalia. Um, one of the most uh, significant innovations in Wabanaki material culture is obviously the canoe, which we, most, a lot of us continue to benefit from that if we're traveling the waterways in vain. And birch bark canoes are absolutely amazing um, pieces of engineering. They're also kind of, that one, that one I think you guys probably found to be nice and small, but beautiful pieces. And they're still making those. They're still fighting battles, right? It's not all, it's not all celebration of roses, so um, back Probably now about a decade ago, the uh, main Wabanaki states have Welfare, Truth, and Reconciliation Commission was created to address the harm that was being caused to the child welfare system in Maine by um, lack of knowledge or disregard for the Indian Child Welfare Act, which, which says that uh, Native children should be, if at all possible, put into Native homes um, for, for a variety of reasons that have been um, not that had not happened in Maine for a long time, and so this, this Truth and Reconciliation Commission was created, and, and, that, and, that, and the system is improving, but it, it gathered the stories of people who had suffered through the foster care system, had been adopted out of their communities. There's, one, there's two wonderful documentaries. There's, there's um, Dawn Land, which is the initial documentary that was made about the process, and then this is an image from Dear Georgina. This is Georgina, who's a passive body woman who tells her story of the harm the way she was treated in, in, in foster homes as a, as a native child. Um, recent court cases that state that the Penobscot Nation, which is the people of the river, is named as the Penobscot River. They live on islands within the river, but the court is saying that the water is not theirs to protect and steward, so that battle continues. Um, this is an example of an uh, event a few, a few years back with Wabana people and their allies. Uh, fighting to protect um, Wabanaki stewardship of the Penobscot River. And then this is a really cool project that is ongoing um, with Wabanaki people in Acadia National Park to understand sweetgrass and how sweetgrass goes and how you harvest sweetgrass. So sweetgrass is a key element of Wabanaki baskets. It has medicinal use, it has spiritual use. Um, it grows in coastal salt marshes, and most of the coastal salt marshes in Maine are controlled by not Wabanaki people, right? They're controlled by private landowners, or in this case, by Acadia National Park. The National Park Service has, has had a kind of a mandate to start working with tribal nations to be able to sustainably harvest traditional materials off of Park Service lands. And this is the one that's happening here, where Wabanaki knowledge keepers who have traditional, what's called traditional ecological knowledge to EK, know that the way they harvest sweetgrass is sustainable, but in order to be able to get permits to harvest the Cape National Park, they have to prove that. Um, so they're working with um, scientists, the National Park Service, and others to monitor how, when they, they, they harvest sweetgrass one step at a time, but they're doing this part where they're mapping out plots, harvesting sweetgrass traditionally, and then tracking those plots over time to see how well the sweetgrass can used to regrow. And, <coughs> Just as, a, as an example, of this, so sweetgrass is hard to get to because it's oftentimes the access to it in the land is owned by others other than Wabanaki. That can also be a problem for, for ash trees for basket making. Um, a lot of ash lands are on privately owned land. Maine, Maine, even Maine's big open tracks are privately owned compared to a lot of parts of the country where that's mostly government owned. Um, I hear I've heard stories of Wabanaki people being chased off land at gunpoint and they're just there to harvest ash trees. Um, and the ash tree is also seriously threatened by the invasive emerald ash borer beetle. Um, I've been working with some Wabanaki folks to harvest basket ash on, on the land where we live in Orland. 
Um, I, I was talking, I said, would it be worth putting some kind of a conservation easement on the land held by one of the tribes so that you would continue to have access if we no longer own the land? And the PhD candidate, you know, Jermaine Suzanne Greenlaw, who's doing this work, said, it's not going to be for that. <coughs> so, Beatles are going to kill it, so I'm going to be here. So, just like, I'll try that, like, that gets me pretty sweet. Those god darn beetles are moving, I mean, kind of further and further off. My like, god, that makes me so uh. So, that's the other one. So I'm going to end with this wonderful project, and, and if you, uh, there's a wonderful book that, I, that we think may be in the library, or if not, it will be added to the library called Horse Blade of Sweetgrass, which Gabriel, who you saw earlier, and his wife Suzanne wrote, um, telling kind of the story of them harvesting sweetgrass with their, with their two daughters. And you see, this is one of their girls. And we the back. And I am happy to take questions. <laughs> like a button. We find buttons as soon as, as soon as trade happens, we find buttons. Um, that was something that was created. Anything, you know, buttons, needles, um, metal things were something traded. But I, that, that, that little bone kind of fastener is the closest that I've seen to that. University of Maine that are doing remote sensing of shell heap sites have used that to some extent. Um, <coughs> part of the challenge is, is LIDAR generally picks up um, like raised areas in the, on the landscape, and when we call these shell heaps, they're actually relatively level nowadays. Um, so I'm not sure how much that particular technology would pick up. Um, it, it, it's, it's been amazing what it has done in like uh, rainforested areas in Central and South America where you have these, you know, like pyramids and stuff that you couldn't see because of the vegetation, and then LIDAR is seeing those. Um, another fascinating use of LIDAR, and I don't know if it's been used in Newfoundland, um, is to find Vikings, to find possible Viking sites in other places in Newfoundland. Um, Sarah Parchak, who's the, like the space archaeologist, is, does stuff with LIDAR and with, with aerial photography. Um, and, our, and there has been other remote sensing done on shell heap sites and other sites. With mixed results, uh, the moisture in the soil tends to make it a little bit less effective. But they, are, but they have used uh, like ground penetrating radar on on uh, wild rock sites in Maine. If you don't mind another question, nobody else nobody else jumped in, so we go for it. What's the rate of of Wabanaki or at least indigenous people coming into the sciences as far as archaeology? Um, it's it's it is it's improving. Um, it's growing. So there are, there are. So Bonnie Newsom, who's a Wabanaki archaeologist, is on the faculty at the University of Maine. Um, three of the Wabanaki tribes have an, an archae a Wabanaki archaeologist as their tribal historic preservation officer. Um, and then Bonnie has a has a couple of Wabanaki students under her graduate students. There's a really wonderful program called Ways Wabanaki Youth in Science. Um, that is working to find ways to bring Wabanaki students into the sciences in a way that is inclusive of traditional knowledge. So I think part of the barrier has been that they, are, they come into science and they're told what you already know is not valid, whereas the work by people like Robin Wall Kimmerer and others has really said that TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, is incredibly important and is complementary to or melds with Western science in some really exciting ways. So that, Wabanaki Youth in Science program, I think, is, is really doing, trying to do some work to recognize that those, can, that those knowledges are complementary and valued together. Um, I'm trying to get more of And there are, there are certainly also um, se several generations of Wabanaki folks in things like forestry um, and forest management within the, on tribal lands and so on, environmental sciences. 
So it's not huge, but um, but definitely you know efforts within the communities to contextualize science in a way that makes sense for indigenous people. I'll get back to you these in just a sec. Yeah. Yeah, I know the Micmac in Nova Scotia did a lot of decorative work with Don Porcupine Quills. Mm -hmm. Was that something that happened in, in Maine as well? Yeah, yeah. The, the Micmac really took it, like, really elaborated it when it came to the, like, trade goods, goods for sale. Um, but there are contemporary, other contemporary Wabanaki people that do it, and there certainly is um, Histor early historic evidence that that Wabanaki people in Maine were decorating much more, not quite like not like the quill boxes, but clothing. That that um, porcupine quill was really important clothing decoration before glass beads came in. Is there any uh, pre-contact? Uh... There, I'm sure there was. It wouldn't preserve particularly well. I'm trying to think. I think I've seen an example of some super early, but again, it was from Nova Scotia. Super early quill work on birch bark. Um, there's, there's just not a lot of context where that would be preserved. So we find small preservation of things like woven material, like woven um, tree bark, not in terms of textile type material. So I'm not aware, it doesn't mean it's not there, but, but certainly the early historic accounts would suggest that that had been being done for a while, and that the way that beadwork was adopted and used would suggest that it was taken, that it was, that it was in part replacing the use of quill with the decoration. But, Part of it's a, a lot of that's a preservation challenge. We don't find, we don't find, we know they in fact porcupine bones, so we know it teeth. We know they were using porcupines, but uh, the nature of, of porcupine quill is that even in a shell, it would be rough for it to survive. So I would say there probably was more some sort of archaeological evidence. Indian dog, the Indian dog that was that was that was encountered when the Europeans described that we see evidence of. Um, the archaeology me evidence says that those came those came with from Asia with with the, the first people that that populated North America, oh, with the Americas. So, so they they were after yes. Yeah, so they had evolved. They had uh, dog domestication happened like thirty thousand years, like way like well like before I think people you know the first evidence of humans in, in at least in this neck of the woods. Um, so it's expected that, that that they were coming along as already as domesticated dogs, um, but there was probably intermixed. I mean, I, can, I can't. I mean, we, we, they didn't yeah. intermix now. So. So there's the evidence of pre-contact, though. Were there coyotes or wolves? There were wolves. Yeah, there were wolves. Coyotes are actually a relatively recent migrant to this area, and they probably came in after wolves were exterminated. Um, but yes, there is absolutely evidence of wolves. Um, there's not, we don't find a lot of wolves, wolf bone in archaeological sites. I don't think they were, I think they were, you know, were predict, you know, similar apex predators and not, not like, like, unlike bear, bear has a lot of useful heart body parts that, that wolves did. Um, but yes, there, we do know there were wolves here. Again, coyotes are a post-colonial introduction to the area. From where? From the, from the, from the south, yeah, from further south. There's no, there is, has been no coyote bone found in, in pre-contact archaeological sites in Maine. There's, there was caribou, which is now gone. Yeah. What about petroglyphs? Are there yep. No. Yeah, so there are, there are, there's definitely an extensive tradition of creating petroglyphs, um, Im imagery pecked into stone surfaces. Um, by the Wabanaki. There are concentrations of petroglyphs. There's, a, there's an area on the Kennebec River. Um, Machias Bay has an incredible concentration of petroglyphs. And then um, some of the boundary lakes between present day Maine and New Brunswick have, have areas of outcroppings of petroglyphs. Um, and there's been some really wonderful work to document and, and, and share and interpret those. They are incredibly fragile. They're, they're disappearing every winter because the, the way they're so they're so um, there's so much on the surface of the rock and with sea level rise and storm increase you know, increasing storm ferocity huge chunks of petroglyphs are disappearing each winter um, not so much in the one of the ones on the Canada but those are those are stewarded and cared for and protected by the Penobscot Pass and the Body folks who have kind of the stewardship for those um, 
there is sometimes access given in tours given mm -hmm. to those locations, uh, but again, it's, 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 it's limited because they're super, they're super fragile. They have wonderful imagery of animals and human, human-like characters. Um, there's a wonderful story about this, you know, there was this old, this male archaeologist who was interpreting, non-Wabanaki, non he was interpreting the petroglyphs, and there was this picture of this person, humanoid, squatting with this round thing between that person, that squatting person's leg and the male archaeologist with all these explanations about this and this and this is what it was and this is what it was. And then a group of women got together to do art inspired by the script. It's like, uh, that's a woman giving birth. That's not any, that's not a shaman or anything. That's a woman giving birth. Um, so it's funny, I just have that, just a woman, women looking at this and thinking, yeah, no, that's pretty obvious what that is. <laughs> Um, as far as the field schools go, um, have the Wabanaki been more involved or heading those efforts, and are there plans for more field schools that are headed by Wabanakis? Probably at some point. Right now, there's not a lot going on. Um, the University of Maine still does a field school, and Bonnie Anderson, who's Scott Scott, leads that. Um, that's, I think, primarily for University of Maine students, and they're working in Machias, Machias area. Um, most other places, the Abbey, Abbey took a serious pause on doing field schools for a couple of reasons. One, because they, they really needed to be more engaged with the, with the, with the Wabanaki Council that is co governs the Abbey Museum to decide whether that one should be done. And also because the Abbey has been doing field schools for decades and hadn't analyzed and published any of those results. And so there was this, uh, there was this recognition that we were harvesting Wabanaki culture and not sharing that, sharing that knowledge back out. Um, I think that there'll be a conversation going forward about um, the impact of climate change and how that's impacting these coastal, very vulnerable coastal sites, um, and whether work needs to happen to recover any of the information from those sites. Um, but that's still an evolving conversation. So there's very little going on at Wabanaki sites. Now, there's, there are field schools happening on Euro, Euro American yeah. historic sites. Um, yeah. yeah. When you were talking about the animals that, with, you know, we found the remains of. I noticed there was no mention of cats. Were cats a European? Yeah, there aren't, no, they didn't have, they certainly didn't have domesticated cats, and there are not, well, um, I don't think, I haven't seen anything that talks, but we certainly do have, I mean, there are certainly wild cats in Maine. There were, there were bed mountain lions, and there's certainly lynx and, and bobcats. Um, there, I don't, I'm not, I'm not aware, I'd have to look, there's, there's a, there's a report from the, um, Turner Farm site on, on North Haven or Rhino Haven that has the most detailed animal analysis done and the most comprehensive list of animals found in Shell Heap sites. But I've never heard about cat being counted. I mean, it, it could be that there's a cultural reason for that. Um, it could be that they're just not, they don't make good eating. I mean, they have good fur, certainly. Um, but no, I'm not aware. Of, and none of the places that I've worked have we. So they didn't have a problem with mice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, they probably would have seen mice. Um, yeah, no, I don't, yeah, I, I mean, well, and they weren't living in, they were the way they were living, you wouldn't, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, they didn't have domesticated cats, and I have not, not seen or read about wild cat remains being found as part of, part of food book remains, so it doesn't mean it wasn't the case, I'm not aware of it. Just a little tidbit of information, um, most of you probably know Paul Breeden, an artist, related, um, gallery. Um, So back when LD291, which is the law requiring Wabanaki studies be taught in all main schools, uh, the Penobscot Nation did a chunk of work and they actually have their curriculum material available on their websites. It's, it's older, it was done early on in the process. Um, the Abbey Museum has curriculum material that's been developed over the years, some of that's being updated. Um, 
The Wabanaki of Maine, the Maritimes, which is one of the books you have on the back table, is still actually a really good educational resource. For, for It has curriculum lesson plan stuff in it. I, there's been some conversation about updating that, um, which would be really cool. The most impressive one that's happening right now is the Portland Public School District um, has really been leading the way on fully implementing LB 291, which is, again, the requirement of Wabanaki Studies Law for Maine, because it's been supposed to be happening for 20 plus years now. Um, three years? I don't know when it was passed. More, yeah. Yeah, 20-ish. Um, and they're just, they're, the, the tools and the resources and the funding was unfunded. It was an unfunded mandate. But they're, they're with a recent study that was done by the ACLU of Maine and a couple of other organizations really pointing out that that deficit that, that hasn't been implemented, there are, that will hopefully spur some more resources. And again, the, the prior, if, if you're a teacher working in the schools, it would be connected with the Portland Public Schools is going to be a really great starting place because they're doing really terrific work. And some of their material is online too. Um, they've got a document that's like guidance for developing Wabanaki curriculum material that's really interesting. Um, for a variety of reasons, they've really, they've really been doing some kind of groundbreaking work on that. Yeah. Um, can you tell us anything about winter versus summer? Kind of, did people move around? Yep. To stay in place? Yeah. So there was a there was this idea that that was carried on for a century or more <coughs> that Wabanaki people lived on the coast in the summertime and then went in the interior in the wintertime, and that there was this was a significant migration that happened. Um, that was what was happening in, in early contact period, be, largely because of the fur trade. So they needed to harvest as many beaver as they possibly could. That was happening in the wintertime. Um, with archaeological work being done on the seasonality that we're seeing, but animal bones, there's, there's a variety of seasonal indicators on animal bones. Um, you can cross-section <coughs> clamshell hinges, you can cross-section deer teeth, and they'll give you evidence of what season of year they were harvested. We now know I mean, well, I'm not going to do this, but archaeologists now know that they were on the coast year-round. They were just in different locations. Um, so they would, you know, in the summertime, you'd be in a place with a nice breeze and less mosquitoes. In the wintertime, you'd be in a more sheltered place. Um, so, and, that, and that plays out with the archaeological data that that's happening. The place I'm most familiar with it is Nascaig Point in Brooklyn, where you see winter sites on one side of the peninsula and summer sites on the other side of the So, yes, they were definitely here year-round, but they were shifting a little bit to, to be warm <laughs> or to be cool. Well, we want to thank you for an excellent program. Thank you. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned a great deal, and I found out there's so much more. It's always interesting to discover things that you want to discover more. And thank you so much yeah. for it. And we have refreshments at the back. We'd like you to eat them so that you don't have to take them home. <laughs> I love to. I, it's, it, I'll talk to a room of any size of folks, but it's great to have a big crowd. So thank you all very much. <laughs>